Good morning. My name is Joe Negretti, and this is my remarkable wife, Jean. <laughs> uh, we would like to welcome you to the Sunday worship service of the Midpoint Ministry Center of the Chicago Church of Christ. We're so glad that you could uh, join us today. Today, we come together to honor and worship our Heavenly Father, God. We come together to commune with Him and to build a better relationship with His Son, Jesus, our Savior. With all that is going on in our world today, I think you will agree, taking time to honor and worship God will go a long way to give us peace and comfort and restore our faith. Mm -hmm. In Philippians 4, 6 through 7, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen. This is our special time to recognize that God is in control and Jesus mm -hmm. is Lord. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 10, 23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, mm -hmm. for he who promised is faithful. Second Thessalonians but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Mm -hmm. Even though we are physically apart, we can still participate in the service today. So please join along in the songs, follow the scriptures in your own Bible and allow your heart to be softened. Let us now go to God in prayer. Dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us. Thank you for allowing us to come together to honor and praise you, to commune with you. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior and perfect example of how to live our lives. Lord, we pray that we will be inspired by your words that we'll hear today. Please allow our hearts to be softened and give us the wisdom to move forward within this troubled world. Help us to be patient, loving and faithful. Please give us strength. Lord, we pray that today's service is pleasing to you and comes as a fragrant offering. May our songs, prayers, and messages bring joy to your heart. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Howdy kids, it's Griff and I'm in charge of this week's Kids Kingdom lesson, so welcome. Uh, this morning I wanted to talk about the newness of the Lord. Now, I mean, what better way to kick off the new year 2021, as crazy as it sounds, to uh, let's talk about having a brand new start. We get to start over and move forward, and it just blows my mind, and I hope y'all are having a great new year, and it's... Uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. I want to talk about uh, what the Bible says about new things and how the Lord will bring about these new things. So let's get into it. So our first scripture reading is going to come out of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. And it reads, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. This passage just fires me up. I mean, we get to have our strength built up. And, you know, it's like when you eat your bowl of Cheerios or your Fruit Loops or whatever you eat in the morning for breakfast. It gets you really strong and fired up for the day. You drink your, your chocolate milk or whatever you like to drink to, to get those bones nice and solid. Um, it also talks about how we're going to soar on wings like eagles. I mean, can you imagine being able to soar in like... Uh, the great warriors of the past on giant eagles. I mean, the, the wings spread out, just, Caw! I can't imagine a more American way to, to go about. And we will run and not grow weary and walk with, and not be faint or tired. The fact that we get to keep moving forward, we keep going, we keep going on, and we're not going to get tired because we're fighting for the Lord. Our second and final scripture reading is going to come out of Psalm 98, verse 1. 
Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. Now, as you saw in the beginning of the video, I love to play music. I like to sing a little bit, but I love playing music. And it just seems so right to sing in praise to God because he's done so many great things and he's given us so many great things. And as we close out today's lesson, I want to encourage you all to try and find how I myself can be anew in the Lord this year. Maybe it's praying more. Maybe it's being kinder to your siblings as hard as that can be. Helping your parents out with chores is, you know, chores aren't the funnest thing to do, um, but being of service to your parents can be a great thing. Maybe it's giving some old toys to someone who needs them, like the ones that you just got for Christmas this recently. Maybe it's learning a new instrument like my banjo here, or a violin or a tuba if you want to. Um, there's so many different things you could do, learning a magic trick, doing card tricks. Um, there's just so many new things out there in the world. And I encourage y'all this week to try and find those new things that you can do for, for the Lord. And make sure this week that y'all actually, uh, I want to make sure that y'all do your doodles this week. You, you draw out today's lesson, what you learned. Maybe it's drawing a giant eagle like I was, like I was demonstrating earlier. Maybe it's me playing the banjo or maybe it's you doing something new or nice for, for someone in your life. And make sure you, uh, do those drawings this week and you can send those to your parents and your parents can email them to midpoint at chicagochurch.org. It'll pop up on the screen here, midpoint at chicagochurch.org. And with that, I'm going to leave you with a little song right at the end. What better way to kick off the rest of service than with a new song? the sun where to stand in the morning who told the ocean you can only come this far and who showed the moon where to hide till evening whose words alone can Catch a falling star. Well, I know my Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer lives. All of creation testifies this life within me. to the weary, the worn and the weak, and the same gentle hands that hold me when I'm broken, they conquer death to bring me Creation
life within me cries. I know my Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer lives. Let all creation testify. Life within me cries, I know my Redeemer lives. Good morning. My name is Ralph Half, and this is my wife, Deb. This is the time in our service when we focus on what Jesus did for us. At this time, Deb would like to share some of her story. Good morning. I'd like to share a couple of scriptures that I believe really go hand in hand. The first one is in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. It reads, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I also would like to read in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself he, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The reason I share these two scriptures is because I truly believe that we need to take captive our thoughts in order to see Jesus more clearly, in order to see what he has done. For my entire life, I have been a runner. Maybe not runner in the way that you might be picturing it, but I ran from things that are too hard. I still run from things that are too hard. But one area in particular that I'd like to share about is jobs. I have had many different jobs in my lifetime. Uh, in order to put that in perspective, for the last 26 years, Ralph has had one job and I have had eight jobs. About 16 years ago, I started a new job. In my opinion, it was a job that I should never have gotten and that I should not have taken. I shouldn't have gotten the job because I was 15 minutes late for my interview because I got lost after not following the direction that my future employer gave me to get there. The reason I shouldn't have taken it is because it was the, the motives. I was taking it for the money and for the job title. <clears throat> so suffice to say, not a good start. The job was very different than I had ever experienced before. The people I worked with and the environment that I was working in. Because of that, I put too much into my, of myself into that job. I was thinking if only I could do better. If only I would have an impact on the people that I worked with. If only they could see all that I was doing. But it seemed the harder that I tried, the more things didn't go well, and the more discouraged and depressed I became. My thoughts became clouded with thoughts of me and less of Jesus. <clears throat> I didn't think I would ever get out. But one night when I just couldn't take it anymore, I sat on the couch of a very dear friend and poured out my heart. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned previously, I never learned how to cope with difficult things and I didn't know how to look for truth. Mm -hmm. But from that point on, I had people in my life that cared about me and directed me towards God. I share that because I needed to learn how to look for truth and how to take my thoughts captive in order to move those clouds out of my head to see Jesus more clearly. Going back to the second scripture, Jesus didn't run when things got hard. 
but I do. He reminds me that life is not easy, but he endured it to the very end. He embraced his task because he was motivated by the love of his father and by his love for me. Even though he knew I would run. The only place I need to run is to him who guides, directs, inspires, and loves. Thank you. Amen. Thanks, Deb. As Deb was sharing this morning, let us clear our minds and focus on Jesus. As we're about to take the bread which represents his body and the blood that represents his and the juice that represents his blood. Let's take some time to reflect on how the sacrifice of Christ has changed your life. Let us pray for the communion. Father, we thank you for the ultimate sacrifice, for you dying on a cross and shedding your blood for the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This concludes our time of communion. The purpose of giving is a time where we give a financial sacrifice that goes towards the work of the ministry and the operation of the Midpoint Center of the Chicago Church of Christ. As the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, on the first day of each week, we should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each one of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So as the scripture says, let us give what we have decided in our heart to give. And let us give with a cheerful heart. Please bow your heads as we pray. Father God, we thank you for your many blessings. I pray that the money given will be used to glorify you. Amen.
Good morning, Midpoint. I hope you guys had a great holiday season. I hope you got some time to slow down a little bit and rest and relax. But it seems just like that, you know, things are back up and in, in going again. And uh, what a crazy week in our country. I hope so many of you guys are praying, praying for uh, the leadership in our country, praying for for our hearts to be focused on God throughout all of this, praying that other people will find God in the midst of all of this. I mean, there has been unprecedented defiance and uh, all sorts of just chaos going on in our world. And one of the things I've learned just observing this week is that democracy is fragile. And, and any of these man-made ideas that we put value in and even things at, at, that are good and noble and helpful they're fragile. They can be corrupted. They can be uh, points of contention amongst people. They are not perfect solutions in every situation. And it's really reminded me that the word of God and the kingdom of God are the only things that went out at the end of the day. And as much as people have tried to, to corrupt and distort the word of God for selfish gain and the kingdom of God for selfish gain, they can't. God is not threatened by humans. God is not threatened by our ideas. He's won. He's already won the battle. And that's the very reason why we're all here together today is we're not here to talk theory. We're not here to talk about what are the best ideas or which ones could be better. We're here to talk about a God who's already won. That's who we get to worship today. And, you know, we are on this journey in the midpoint to become wholehearted disciples. And I, I want to remind us of our vision statement for a second. It says, we envision generations of wholehearted disciples intent on loving God and embracing the cross, surrendered to Jesus, committed to his mission, determined to discover their God-given gifts to serve his kingdom and advance the gospel who accept his call to give up everything, go anywhere, do anything, and become whatever God calls them to be. You know, in 2021, I was thinking about what, what would my goal or focus be? And we spent time thinking about, okay, what is this going to look like for us as a ministry? Our goal and focus to become wholehearted. And I was looking through my notes, and I actually wrote down notes a little over a year ago, the end of 2019, about my goal for 2020, and you want to know what my theme for 2020 was, was to have a new heart, which was funny because God's saying, all right, yeah, Tanner, you wanted to have a new heart. I'm going to make your heart whole. And I was reading the scripture out of Ezekiel 11 uh, verses 19 and 20, where he says, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. And I think there's a lot in common between having a, a new heart in God and being wholehearted. But this idea of wholehearted has a lot of connotations associated with it. Now, the world will say that wholehearted means passionate. You need to be passionate about something if you want to be wholehearted. But that's not exactly what the Word of God says. In the Word of God in the Bible, it doesn't say that passion necessarily equals wholeheartedness. We had a display of that in our nation this week, didn't we? There was a lot of passion that wasn't necessarily whole and truthful. Although some people might have claimed that it was for them in that situation, but that can't be the truth of God. That just because someone feels passionate about it makes them whole or makes something whole. Proverbs chapter 19 verses 2 and 3 say, Desire without knowledge is not good. How much more will hasty feet miss the way? A person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. You know, like I said, as as we look at wholehearted, you might have a lot of connotations that come into your mind. I certainly do. When I think of wholehearted, there are terms like organic and wellness and completeness and wholeness and uh, passion and emotion and grit and an emptying of self. And, and these are all 
terms that are kind of tangential to, to wholehearted, but we hear a lot of those in the world today. You know, you need to be whole or what it's like to feel whole. And to an extent, these things are true. This is the vernacular that we use on a regular basis. These are posts that many of you share on, on Facebook or on Twitter, you know, about how I can be more whole this year. In our context, this appears very healthy and very valid. Part of this is very deeply intertwined within the scripture. You know, when Jesus sums up the entire Torah, he says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and all throughout the Torah are these ideas of, of Sabbath and community and wholeness of, of rest and being together. And so we derive a lot of this idea of being wholehearted or being whole from these ancient concepts. But the challenge to just taking those and adding this idea of passion to being wholehearted is that in the world today, it comes up with some very negative effects. For instance, uh, there are so many statements that I hear about being wholehearted that I don't feel like are in line with the scripture. For instance, the idea, follow your heart. That might be someone... Uh, someone's advice to someone who wants to be wholehearted is, is to follow your heart, take that passion and, and just go with it. And sometimes following your heart is really good if your heart is in line with the word of God. But if your heart is not in line with the word of God, following your heart will not make you wholehearted in the righteous sense. We are surrounded by, by these types of pseudo spiritual one-liners, these things that sound good and they're memorable and they're easy to, to share on social media and they make bumper stickers and great greeting cards and, you know, uh, people retweet them all the time and celebrities endorse these phrases. We're surrounded by all these phrases about the heart and about being whole. But when you just say that wholeheartedness means to be passionate about something, you miss the mark. There are nominal sins in the Bible that come about from wholeheartedness. The, these statements of follow your heart can lead to divorce and immorality, adultery, being impulsive, self con lack of self-control, greed, envy, hate, discord, fits of rage, a host of other evil desires. Those could all be things that are achieved by being wholehearted in the passionate sense. The word of God says to be wholehearted is so much more than to just having some passion for something. It's about what that passion is for. The object of your passion determines whether or not you can actually be wholehearted. This worldly understanding of wholehearted is like reading chicken soup for the soul and then saying it's the same thing of the word of God. Now, if you like that book, I'm not knocking that book, but I am saying it's nowhere close to the truth of the word of God. The truth isn't truth because it's a catchy phrase. The truth isn't truth because a celebrity endorsed it or it makes for a nice bumper sticker or you can share it on Facebook. The truth isn't truth because you like it. The truth isn't truth because you're passionate about it. The truth that makes you whole is truth because it was ordained by God and it's found in his word. And as we seek to be people that are wholehearted, that is where wholehearted begins. It begins with a deep foundation in the truth of God. It's not about your passion if your passion is misguided and placed somewhere else. It's about your passion being solidified and cemented and growing out of the truth of the word of God. I'm going to read a story here in 1 Samuel for a second. But what happens is, is Samuel is kind of the handoff in the Old Testament before Saul comes in and becomes the first king of Israel. There's this big shift in power. There's this big handoff of leadership. In a lot of ways, there's a, the nation of Israel is toying with some idolatry at that point. They want a king. They want to be passionate about a king the way the other nations were passionate about their kings. And as Samuel is leaving, he's giving this farewell speech and he warns them, about what they should be passionate about, what they should give their heart fully to. Not to a king, not to a president, not to a leader, but he says in his dying words, you need to focus on God. 1 Samuel chapter 12, starting in verse 20. 
Do not be afraid, Samuel replied. You have done all this evil. Yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve him with all your heart. Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you, because they are useless. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you and I will teach you the way that is good and right. Be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. I love at the very end of this, Samuel doesn't hold anything back. He says, be sure to follow the Lord with all of your heart. He says, I will show you the way, not a way. I will show you the way. And I will teach you what is good and right. If we want to follow God with all of our heart, we have to follow the way. What is good, what is right. Not just about what we're emotionally passionate about in a moment, but what is cemented and true in the word of God. That's what Samuel says is to follow God with all of your heart. I think many of you know about my son, Emmett. And many of you guys have been praying for us and you're aware of of what our journey for a little bit over a year now has been with uh, from the time Jessica was 20 weeks pregnant and we went into an ultrasound, we found out that our son had a rare congenital heart defect and he literally had a hole in his heart that needed to be repaired. And there was a host of other complications that, that came in and out with this diagnosis, but we knew our son was going to need to have his heart repaired. We knew the hole was going to have to be patched, that his heart wasn't in fact whole, and that it was going to need to be made whole. That's part of the reason our son was named Emmett. We spell his name E-M-M-E-T-T. But there's a Hebrew word, and it's found in 1 Samuel, in the scripture we just read. But the word is emet, E-M-E-T. And that Hebrew word is is where the name Emmet comes from down the line. And I want to tell you a little bit about this word, Emmet. Now, it's the word in 1 Samuel 12 that we just read where it's the word for faithful at the very end here. Uh, And that word is, is translated different ways throughout the Bible. It's translated as faithful. It's translated as true. But it comes from a from a word, uh, a Hebrew word, that means to make secure, to support and make firm. That's where the word emet comes from. And so what this word emet means in Hebrew is it does mean true, but not true in the factual sense, not true in the static Greek thought, did you get the test correction, true or false? You know, it's not about that type of truth. It's about a truth of integrity. Like when you take something and there's a material in your hand and it has a weight to it, when you, when you can't break it, when it holds up under the stress that it's supposed to hold up and you say, this is true, this has integrity to it, this is solid and it holds its form under duress, that definition for true is what the word emet means. That's what this word faithful means. When he says to serve God with all of your heart, it means in a way that is unwavering, that, that can't be crushed, that holds its shape under duress. It means to be made firm. It doesn't mean to be factually correct and passionate about it. It means to be made firm and whole. This word is used as God describes himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 34. God uses this same word to describe his character, and his faithfulness. This word is found all throughout the Old Testament, and many, many rabbinical teachings are centered on this word, emet. It's one of the most important concepts in the Old Testament literature. Um, Many rabbis will quote, Genesis 2-3 is the last verse in the creation account. And the last three words in that are, bara Elohim la'astat, and Those are the words God created to do. Each of those words, the first letter of each of those words spells the word emet. 
like deep in the, in the heart of this, we are created to do and to be God. We are created to be firm and to do the things that God ordained for us to be. There are 28 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. The three letters that make the word emet are the first, the middle, and the last letter. It encompasses the entire alphabet. And if you take out the first letter and it's just the middle and the last, you get the word death in the Hebrew language. Like this just keeps going on. Even the rabbis teach about the spelling of the letters and and the way each of these letters sits firmly on two feet, the actual letters itself, instead of on a point. And it's to show how firm, like the, the point of this word is about being solid and firm, not just being passionate, about being grounded in the truth of who God is. And when we are passionate in who God is with that firm truth, that's the wholeheartedness that changes the world. It's not passionate about an idea that's fragile or about an idea that is debatable. It's passionate about something that is true and firm and uncompromising and something that cannot lose. When our son was born, he had to be made whole. His heart had to be repaired. It had to be firm. It had to be able to support the pumping and the oxygen and the things that were going on in it. But I also knew that as my son grows up, I want his heart and his faith in God to be firm and secure and whole. That's what it means to be wholehearted. This is the beginning of wholehearted. Now, the dangerous part is there are so many things out there that tell you this is what wholehearted looks like. And we can get deceived. We can get caught up in in the passions. We can get caught up in these celebrity type pursuits and things that are endorsed about being whole and, and all of this wholeness. And some of them are very, very good. And some of them are not. I have a very close friend that was going to see a counselor talking through some family issues And the friend told me that the advice that this Christian counselor gave was, you don't have to love your family member. You just have to be able to be around them from time to time. That's not the firm truth of the word of God. That is a worldly truth masquerading as wholeness. But it is not the wholeness. It is not the emet. It is not the security that we find in the truth of God's word. And I wish there was a test. I wish we have all sorts of tests in the engineering world to see whether products are going to fail or not. And sometimes as Christians, I wish there was a quick way to test every little piece of advice that was out there to find out whether this was real truth or just a fake truth. And you know what? There is a test. The test is the word of God. This advice or this form of pursuit of wholeness that you might be into, does it match the word of God? In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is is finishing his Sermon on the Mount. Probably the best sermon ever given. And Jesus is summarizing all of these teachings, which are very much reflecting the teachings of the Old Testament. And, And Jesus is summarizing all of it. And at the very end of it, he tells a story. And the last story to conclude his sermon is about the wise and foolish builders. And in Matthew 7, Jesus talks about the difference between someone who builds with a wholehearted truth and the difference between someone who builds on their own truth, on a truth that is not the word of God, on a truth that has not already won and been proven correct, on a truth that maybe they're just passionate about or that is convenient for them in that moment. Brothers and sisters, as we become wholehearted, I hope we don't take the capital T out of truth and make it small and make it convenient for ourselves, and make it relative to what we want it to be. We have to embrace the truth of God's word. Wholehearted is not just about something that you're passionate about and you chase after it, and that's cool for you, but maybe not for someone else. Being wholehearted, being having this integrity that stands up under pressure, And the pressure will come. We know that from the wise and foolish builders. Every single one of us will be tested. And we have to withstand the flood. We have to withstand when the rains come down. That's what Jesus is talking about. That's what Samuel was talking about. That's what the word of God talks about. 
It's not about what you're passionate about, what you're just giving your emotional heart into. It's about what is firm and secure and sound and holds its weight and shape under duress. And then at the end of the day, when the rains come, when the trials come, when the flood comes, when things happen in 2021 that we thought would have stopped in 2020, when more things come up and more challenges come our way, that we stand firm, that our heart is whole, that it has integrity and it is solid. That is my prayer for us this year. That is the beginning of wholeheartedness. And yes, we're going to add the passion to it. We're going to add that, that emotional outpouring to it. But all of that must come from something that is stable and true and secure and timeless and heavenly and certain. And that is God's perfect word. Let's remember to do that. Let's not stray from God's word because we found a blog that helps us more. Let's not put our faith in bumper stickers instead of in the truth of the word of God. Let's commit to following this and letting our hearts be made secure because of his eternal truths. I love you guys. I hope you have a great day.